tonight, what I want to talk a bit about as a case in point is Iran, where communication has been controlled for so long, and actually in much of the Middle East, by governments. It's your quintessential top-down command communication environment. And, and the reason I talked about Haiti, even though this was supposed to be a talk about, about the Middle East, is that when you're in a situation of a natural disaster, and I've covered a few of those, the, the communication system are severely constrained when things come down, when the infrastructure falls apart. And you're actually falling, you're into a same similar situation where communication is very difficult. So it's actually possible to make some parallels between the two. Now in Iran, just so you know, this is a fairly wired country. Um, there's a great deal of online activity. They had Facebook um, and Twitter unblocked in early 2009 for the first time. And this is the Twitter page, um, uh, sorry, the Facebook page for um, the opposition leader. Uh, and so, and he actually has a very successful Twitter account too. So this is not something that's entirely foreign to this country and to this culture. And in fact, there are there's said to be 25 million users online in Iran. Blogging is huge in Iran. Uh, it's they haven't quite figured out the statistic, but there's anywhere between 40 to 70 thousand, well actually 40 to 700 thousand blogs, depending on how you count it. Half the country has mobile phones. This is a really interesting graphic that was put together by the Berkman Center at Harvard University that just gives you a sense of the diversity and strength of the blogging world in Iran. And you can see that you've got the your typical sort of I mean, what you see here in the United States, sort of the liberal politics of, of the internet um, there, but then you see even conservative politics and religious views using it. So it's really interesting to see the, the mix of how the internet is being used there. Mobile technology has had a huge impact generally on the Middle East. Even when I was uh, covering the war, to, when I was traveling around Arab countries, it was really amazing to me to see how people were using just text messaging on their cell phones to, to create opposition type meetings and rallies. This is something that the government really couldn't control as much. This is actually a quote, this person didn't say this quote, this is just a, a photograph, um, but this is a quote from a recent article in the Economist magazine from an Iraqi woman. I love my mobile phone like a baby. And this is in response that the Economist um, said that asked to name the single biggest benefit of America's invasion, Many Iraqis failed to mention freedom or democracy, but instead praised the advent of mobile phones. So this is how big this, this technology is in that part of the world. And in fact, if we just pull the camera out a little bit and just talk about mobile technology generally in the world, it's said that there are 4.6 billion mobile subscriptions in this, in this world of 7 billion. And this is a quote from the Nokia, the chairman of, the, of, of Nokia, which is the largest cell phone manufacturer in the world. Not so much here in the United States, but they are the largest in the world. And it's said that uh, in China, every month there are seven million new people coming online to use the internet. And most of those people are using, them, using the internet through mobile technology and not through a PC. So we need to understand that the revolution is actually happening you know, through a device that fits into our pocket and it's not necessarily through what we're used to here in the United States. So suddenly we have this really powerful, pervasive communication tool through which we can convey content and ideas to the world with really just a very simple click of a key. And that's quite amazing. Because you know I keep talking about how communication used to occur. Uh, Clay Shirky from New York University has this great book called Here Comes Everybody. And he has this notion that in the 20th century, our communication system was very much about filtering than publishing. The idea was that communication technology, to be able to communicate to large audiences in the 20th century, took a lot of money and a lot of resources to buy a satellite system or a printing press. So if you were going to communicate, you wanted to make sure that whatever you put out there was polished enough and universally interesting enough to reach a large part of, uh, number of people to amortize your cost and to get a good return on investment. And so the idea was that whatever you did, you filtered it first, then you put it out there. Well, that equation has been turned on its head. And now it's an idea of publishing, then filter. Now you don't even have to think about it. You just put it out there with things as cheap and pervasive as cell phones and whatever, and Facebook and Twitter. You just put it out there and hopefully it's gonna stick somewhere because people are now in this receiving mode. And, and what's most interesting about this is that our motivation for us putting things out there for the most part is not monetary. We're not producing the way that an NBC produces. We're not in the business of producing content. 
it's, we're actually socially motivated to do this. You know, we may all have day jobs where communication is not actually part of what we do, but we find this excess capacity. This is something that Yohai Benkler from Yale University talks about in his really excellent book, Wealth of Networks. We have this excess capacity to produce content and communication to share with the rest of the world that actually has a social motivation as opposed to a monetary motivation. And that is really powerful as well because it's, it, it actually shows a different intent and it means that it's harder for companies that do this for a living to try to compete with people who are doing it for free for other reasons. So if we go back to Iran, last summer, you had a very uh, filtered and published controlled communication system that came head on right up against an increasingly engaged, frustrated, phone-toting, published and filter uh, a, a community. And this is what happened. The government you know, in their, this is what they traditionally do when they encounter uh, any kind of resistance and they're feeling like they're being threatened. They shut down the mass media. They throw out the foreign journalists. This is what happened in Iraq. And so all of these photos that you see here were actually taken by amateurs. This is citizen journalism. This is what Henry Jenkins from MIT loves, that, you know, a journalist can't be everywhere, but people are everywhere. And if people are everywhere and they suddenly have a tool to capture what's going on, that's quite amazing, and that's where the power is. So our, suddenly for many of us outside of Iran with no journalists and no traditional trustworthy agents within Iran telling us what's going on, this became our 24-hour news channel. For those of you who aren't on Twitter, this is what you call a hashtag. And so w people, when they want to create a term that can be searched in Twitter, will put that little number sign in front of a term and then it can be easily tracked of what people are saying. And so Iran election for a few, for a few weeks was the tra trending search term on Twitter. And it became so crucial uh, for, uh, as an information conduit for people both in, well, actually for the most part outside of Iran, that the, um, the U.S. government asked Twitter not to shut down overnight one night to do a system upgrade because they felt like if they did that, it would cut out communication for a, a good number of people. So Twitter was being used as a conduit for information for people outside of Iran to find out what was going on. And apparently inside Iran, they were using it uh, primarily on their cell phones to organize uh, some of um, these rallies. So it was a very important tool. And I don't know if any of you were on Twitter at the time, if you are on Twitter, but a lot of people outside of Iran in support of what was going on there would change their avatars, the little logos that represent who you are online, to green, to, to support the green revolution. So all of a sudden there was a lot of green on people's Twitter pages. And they even changed their time zone to the Tehran time zone to hope to foil uh, censors in, in support. So this was what's going on. In the meantime, the traditional 24-hour news channel was getting this on Twitter, that there was a sense <laughs> that that CNN was actually deliberately not covering the protest because they were trying to cozy up uh, to get preferential treatment from the regime. And so these are some of the conspiracy theories that go on, but it also demonstrates some of the lack of trust in traditional media generally right now and why people are looking for these new sources as choices. But it was this emotional video, and I'll show a little bit of you, but it's quite graphic. Um, that was shot on a cell phone camera in the heart of the, the protest uh, back in June. And then it was uploaded to YouTube that really galvanized the opposition movement and it truly caught non-Iranian's uh, non attention. I believe even President Obama commented on it. And so by now, the government was blocking Twitter and Facebook, but you know, dissidents were using proxy servers, et cetera, to get, a, get around it. But this, you know, this emotional piece of video shot with an amateur content creation tool is what really drove people to the next level. And what's even uh, more interesting is that the government has started to play this game in Iran. Last week, the Iranian government has really recognized that this Nida video has been very powerful. So they actually used the same medium that got, out, that it got the story out to actually create a rebuttal because they're preparing for whatever's going to come next. So I'll play a bit of that. During Iran's post-election <coughs> unrest, a video of the alleged death of a young Iranian woman Right behind me brought tears to the eyes of many while well, the clip was streamed repeatedly over the internet and became the focus of media attention in the west however an investigative television producer in iran has made a documentary which shows another side of nada al-sultan's death 